Hello and welcome to this uh, event. We're, today we are launching new research um, on remote and hybrid work and how we can make it inclusive for disabled workers. Before we get into the session, if you'd like to turn on subtitles for the event, you can just go to the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a button that says CC. If you click on that, you can turn on your subtitles. So I'm Mel Wilkes, I'm Head of Research here at the Work Foundation. We are a think tank focused on improving work in the UK, and I'm going to be chairing the session today. Now, there's been a lively public debate about changes in where and how we work since the onset of COVID-19. But too often the perspectives and the experiences of disabled workers just haven't been part of that discussion. And that was really the driver for, for the research that we're going to be talking about today. We developed a responsive project, which has been generously funded by the City Bridge Trust to develop new evidence about how disabled workers have experienced that transition to remote and hybrid work. And crucially also to understand the breadth of perspectives and ambitions for remote and hybrid work among disabled workers in the future. Through the session we're going to be hearing from my colleagues on the research team who will talk about what we've learned through the project before getting into a discussion with a fantastic lineup of, of panellists and questions from the audience. As audience members you can submit a question at any, any time. Uh, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you could try and use that rather than the chat, it just makes uh, my job as chair a little bit easier to keep track of questions. You can also upvote questions that other audience members um, post in the Q&A box, so do keep an eye on that through the session. If anyone would like to ask a question using sign language, um, then we just let us know and we can enable video sharing for you. Before we get into that though, uh, for now, I'll hand over to Paul Martinelli, who is Chair of the Grants Committee at Shed City Bridge Trust. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Mel, and thank you all for coming today. We are absolutely delighted to see so many of you at this special event to launch the findings of a very timely and topical research study commissioned by the City Bridge Trust. My name is Paul Martinelli, and I'm the Chair of the Grants Committee here at London's largest independent funder, the City Bridge Trust. This is the first piece of independent substantive research that we've commissioned. Our funding strategy, Bridging Divides, aims to create a more equitable London. As we look to transform the lives of the most marginalised people in the capital, it is absolutely critical that we partner with deaf and disabled communities to achieve this goal. Our Bridge to Work programme brought together several sector partners to transform access to employment for the 1.4 million people with disabilities in the capital at working age. With our partners, we had great success with that programme. We established an online training resource for autistic young job seekers. We created a bursary fund to support disabled young Londoners into paid work experience. And we provided structured follow-on support for young people completing their supported internships. But we know, and you know, that much remains to be done if we're to achieve equity in this issue. This research is another important step towards making work accessible for disabled people. Barriers and challenges for disabled people to access employment remain. The reasons are well evidenced and hotly debated, but not widely researched. So we are very keen to be part of advancing this conversation with strong evidence, not least to support the government in their goal to see one million more disabled people in work between 2017 and 2027. A positive transition to disability inclusive hybrid working will be a key part of its success. I want to take this opportunity to thank the research team at Lancaster University and the Work Foundation for conducting this significant and timely piece of research. And also to thank the members of the research advisory group who provided their expert advice and steer from research design through to report delivery. I also want to assure you that at City Bridge Trust, we will not stop here. We will work with our partners to ensure the research findings are shared widely and can you continue to shape this important debate on hybrid working for disabled people. So without further ado, may I introduce you to our guest panel members today. Shani Danda, a disability inclusion and accessibility consultant. Mark Russell, inclusion, diversity and equity manager at KPMG. Paulette Cohen, head of diversity and inclusion at Barclays. And Alice Arkwright, policy and campaigns officer in the equalities team at the TUC. So now let me hand you back to Mel Wilkes, who will introduce our research presenters and will be chairing today's panel. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Paul. And just thanks again to you and the wider team at City Bridge Trust, both for funding the project 
and for the support that you've provided throughout and in promoting the research. I'm now going to hand over to Heather Taylor and Paula Holland, who are going to talk through what we've done through this research project, what we found and our recommendations for employers and policymakers. Over to you, Heather and Paula. No, sorry, I had a problem with my video again. Great, so before Heather presents the findings of our research, I'm gonna speak a little bit about the context of the study. So I don't need to tell you that disabled people experienced considerable employment disadvantage. This slide shows the magnitude of the disability employment gap in the UK from 2013 onwards. This very marked employment inequity has remained stubbornly wide during that period, with disabled people having significantly lower employment rates than non-disabled people. Disabled people are also more likely to work in lower skilled occupations, the average earnings are significantly lower, and they're more likely to experience severely insecure work than non-disabled people. Next slide, please, Heather. A key driver of the disability employment gap is organisational inflexibility and inadequate provision of workplace adjustments. Lots of studies have shown that implementing workplace adjustments, including flexible working practices, support disabled people's job entry, job retention and progression. Although working from home had already been shown to be positive for disabled people's employment, it wasn't widely available prior to the pandemic and was still largely seen as a perk for senior staff, while some employers were even reluctant to allow remote or hybrid working as a reasonable adjustment. So it took a pandemic to see widespread use of remote working. Most studies conducted during the pandemic on workers' experiences of remote working focused on the broader workforce. So research on disabled workers' ex experiences have been scarce. Next slide, please. So our study with City Bridge Trust sought to explore disabled workers' experiences of remote and hybrid working and the challenges and opportunities they pose for their job retention, job entry, progression and productivity. And also what factors disabled workers and employers perceive as enabling inclusive hybrid working and home working. I'm going to hand over to Heather to tell you about the methods we used and the study findings. Thanks Paula. Um, so our research methods, we took a mixed method approach with this project. Um, so that involved a UK wide survey of 406 disabled people and also 20 qualitative interviews with disabled people who were either living or working for an organisation that's based in Greater London. We also hosted two roundtable discussions, so one with employers and business support organisations and the other with uh, frontline advice and support organisations, so the types of organisations that have helplines um, offering employment advice and advice for disabled people. Um, so on to the research. Um, so the overriding theme in this research that we found was autonomy and control. So where remote working has worked well for disabled workers, having autonomy and control over where and crucially how they work is key where workers reported a lack of decision-making over their work arrangements. This was associated with less favourable outcomes for individuals and ultimately their organisations, um, including staff feeling undervalued, disengaging from work and experiencing burnout. So having more control over where and how they work gave some of our research participants other forms of flexibility in the way of more autonomy over their hours. Um, this was particularly useful in helping to manage caring responsibilities and maintaining a good work-life balance. Um, but there's also some sort of disability specific benefits as well. So according to our survey, 70% of disabled workers said that losing access to remote working would negatively affect their health. Positive impacts of remote working were reinforced by many interviewees um, who said they found it easier to rest and take regular breaks when working from home compared to when being in the office. Um, and this was particularly important for those 
who experience energy limiting conditions and also have fluctuating conditions. Some participants also spoke about being able to manage health conditions in private, not having to explain sort of why they were having to take breaks to do certain things or, you know, being able to take uh, medical appointments over the phone or administer medication in the privacy of their own home as a benefit as well. Um, so it's perhaps then no surprise that all these benefits have led to 85% of the disabled workers that we surveyed reporting that they feel more productive working from home than in the workplace. And again, there was a lot of reasons given for this, um, things like less distractions at home or just their home setup being better for them than the workplace environment. Um, but overwhelmingly, this uh, product increase in productivity was linked to positive impacts that they felt on their health and well-being. Therefore, 80, you know, again, perhaps unsurprising, 80% of disabled workers that we surveyed said that working from home would be essential or very important if they were looking for a new job. Uh, those with multiple impairments were actually more likely to say this. So existing evidence indicates that the employment rate for individuals with multiple impairments is lower than those with a single impairment. So ensuring access to remote and flexible working practices is particularly important for those who face the greatest barriers entering, staying and progressing in work. Um, and we found that the majority of disabled workers don't want to return to pre-pandemic working patterns, but there is substantial variation in what they do want. And this will or could present a challenge for some organisations. So as you can see in this slide, close to 66% of the disabled workers that we surveyed want to work remotely for four or five days a week, but there's a lot of variation in what the remainder would like. So it's not true to say that all um, disabled people want to work remotely all the time. Um, but these preferences don't mean that working remotely is without its challenges for disabled workers. However, even those who indicated a strong preference for working remotely spoke about challenges that they'd faced. Um, so the pre-pandemic workplace was not always inclusive and we can see that some of the challenges experienced there have moved over to the hybrid working world as well. Um, so in terms of the challenges, isolation was a big one. So relationships with colleagues, networking and social events are a core part of our working lives. Several interviewees said that they missed social interactions with their colleagues and others didn't feel this. Um, until the, uh, the organisation moved into a more hybrid ways of working, they're now starting to feel more left out uh, as they choose to work remotely, perhaps more than some of their other colleagues do. Some interviews also felt that while their managers allowed them to continue to work remotely, this was being done reluctantly and they were concerned about whether they'd be allowed to work more remotely in the future. So we heard from one participant saying that they felt like they were on the naughty step for choosing to work remotely more often than the rest of their team um, and experiencing a lack of understanding from their manager and colleagues as to why this was important for them. And uncertainty about your, the employer's future plans was a strong theme, even for those who felt that their employers ultimately would accommodate their needs and preferences. But it is concerning that for a lot of disabled workers, this is unknown at the moment. Also on equipment and using the Access Work Scheme, uh, while our survey found that most of the disabled workers, 89% um, actually had the equipment that they needed to work from home. In the interviews, that really highlighted that for many people, this was because they purchased this themselves rather than it being provided by the organization. Now, there's a range of reasons for that. Sometimes it was just because they, they sort of saw it as easier or quicker to just do this themselves rather than the organization fly out saying, no, we're not gonna provide this, but it is still uh, concerning this is the case. And also we heard that um, one in five up nearly one in five of the participants who had requested a reasonable adjustment while working remotely didn't get this and there were no alternative arrangements put in place. 
So that's really concerning as well. And then with using the access to work scheme, gov the government scheme that funds um, additional adjustments for disabled people, we had really mixed experiences of this. So when it works well, it totally is transformative of people's working lives. But we did also have reports of really long delays in getting equipment or getting their um, application process, you know, up to kind of five months, which is really not good. You know, lost paperwork and confusion on both sides um, of the employee and the employer who was responsible for what in the process. Um, one of the biggest concerns that was highlighted to us, though, was concerns about career prog progression and access to opportunities. So working from home some or all of the time can mean reduced visibility and findings from our survey suggest that disabled workers are concerned about what this could mean for their careers. Previous work condition research found that legacy attitudes about remote working could persist and that this presents real risk for employees who pursue hybrid options. Respondents to this survey with multiple impairments were more likely to anticipate negative impacts from working remotely. Um, as you can see in, in this chart. So 70% of people with two or more impairments said that stretch opportunities could go to those who are in the office, and that's compared with 53% of those with single impairments. So this is significant. Now on to recommendations for our research. So as we adapt to new modes of working, it's key that organisations are supported to make sure that their working patterns and environments are truly inclusive so that choosing to work from home is really a choice and not an inevitability resulting from poor accessibility for disabled staff. Um, so um, there's a number of steps that employers should be taking. Number one, investing in training and supporting their line managers who have a critical role in embodying organisational values and culture. So this training should include um, our best practice around dealing with flexible working and reasonable adjustment requests. Managers need to be empowered to think creatively in responding to these requests and equipped with the tools and confidence to have conversations with all employees about their needs and preferences and what else can be done to help them um, in terms of their productivity and well-being at work. And again, consultation. This should be a continuous exercise aimed at developing a thorough understanding of employees and the pressures we deal with. This is particularly important given the importance of autonomy that this research has highlighted. So um, a top-down approach isn't going to work for many organisations when it comes to developing their hybrid working and remote working policies. Also, not all jobs can be done remotely. And as this research has highlighted, not everyone wants to work in this way all the time or even at all. And um, so employers should look beyond hybrid and remote working and support the full spectrum of flexibility. And that can include things like job sharing comp and compressed hours. Finally, um, employers should look into workplace adjustments passports. Now, this is a tool that um, helps communicate needs and preferences uh, and has traditionally been used for disabled workers and people with health conditions. Um, this sort of travels with the individual as they move throughout the organization or if their line manager changes, things like that. So they're not having to have repeated conversations all the time about their needs and sort of justifying all the time why they need certain things or why they would like certain working patterns, for example. Um, but I think, well, we think, and we have heard in this research that having these passports for all and not just for disabled people can help to reduce the stigma in making these requests because after all, everyone benefits from flexibility in different ways. Um, and for government, our first recommendation is that flexibility should be made, so flexible working should be made the default for all employees with flexible options, included in all job adverts. Um, obviously, with um, the, a narrowing of the range of reasons as to why uh, flexible, flexibility can't, can't happen. So not everyone meets the Equality Act definition of disability or identifies as disabled. So this is really important that government sort of looks beyond just the basic legal requirements um, in terms of reasonable adjustments. Large employers should also be required to publish their flexible and hybrid working policies externally and monitor take up across different worker groups. So not only disability, but gender and people with caring responsibilities, things like that. And as well as sort of publishing how, how this works in their operation, 
they should also um, develop action plans of how they're going to drive improvement um, using the data that they've um, gathered in their organisation. Funding for the Equality and Human Rights Commission should also be increased to allow them to constructively challenge more organisations who don't provide reasonable adjustments for disabled workers. So this um, is really important in terms of raising the visibility of the work that they do um, to the like wider public. And also access to work and the disability confidence scheme needs re reformed or refreshed. So these are two programmes where the intention is really promising, but um, they're not always executed well. So if you've read the research, you'll have seen with access to work that um, it can really be transformative for people, but too often um, people are failed by the system. And similarly with the disability confident accreditation scheme, um, this is for employers uh, to, uh, um, show that they are inclusive in their hiring practices. Um, this really could do with updating to reflect our sort of new working lives and um, the different challenges that people come up against. So um, that's all from me now. So we'll stop sharing the screen. Fantastic. Thank you, Heather. And thanks, Paula, too. Um, I can already see quite a few questions are coming through in the Q&A, so thanks all of you for uh, who have asked a question. Um, before we get into addressing those, um, I'm going to hand over to our panellists um, who, so if, if, if a panellist, please, could you uh, turn on your, your videos? Um, what we'll do is go to each panellist in turn initially um, for some reflections on the research. And then we'll have a chance to get into questions both for the research team and for our panellists here today, because I can tell the audience will be keen to get going. Um, now, on the panel today, I know Paul um, has, has already introduced our panellists, but as I've mentioned, it's a fantastic um, panel. We have Paul Let's Cohen, who's Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Barclays, Alice Arkwright, Policy and Campaign Support Officer in the Equality Team at TUC, Shani Danda, a Disability Inclusion and Accessibility Consultant, and Mark Russell, who is Inclusion, Diversity and Equity Manager at KPMG UK. Um, now, uh, if it, is it all right, Shani, if I come to you first of all? Um, now, Shani, you have extensive experience in this space, working as a consultant, um, advising employers about best practice in making their workplaces in inclusive. Mm. It would be great to hear a little bit more about that, about your reflections on the research findings in that context. Um, mm. and, and to think a little bit about any reflections on you know, our, our asks um, that, that, that Heather's just been talking through. Yeah, I, I just want to start by saying that this research is pretty groundbreaking. We know that disabled people have been affected adversely by the pandemic in so many different ways. And this research just goes to show how much in terms of employment. And I think it's really highlighted the benefits that having autonomy over a work environment has brought to so many disabled people, but in turn, the effect that that then has to non-disabled people because of them being open to much more flexible working practices. And as we know, when we create solutions for disabled people, those solutions can be extended to everybody. So everybody benefits in the end. And I think employers and policymakers do need to do so much more to ensure access and flexibility going forward and this is exactly what this report sets out. I think sadly what I'm still continuing to see is now employers are encouraging their workforce to get back into the office and are sort of forgetting you know everything that had been put in place in terms of flexible or, or remote working and as all the speakers have said not all disabled people want to work remotely 100% of the time or at all. And I think what we tend to forget when meeting the needs of disabled people is that we all have needs as well as preferences. So if something works for one disabled person, it doesn't mean that the rest of the pop disabled population equally want that. So I think what this report also helps to highlight is flexibility is key to everything and blanket approaches do not work. Um, so yeah, I just want to say, say thank you for this research. It's, it's extremely um, eye-opening and helps people like me to, 
to create a, a better business case for when we are working with employers. And it's not just about a business case, it's about a moral obligation, but having the data really helps to bring that these points home. So thank you again. Fantastic, thank you, Shani. Um, it's really, and I mean, at that point about not imposing a kind of blanket approach, one of the things that I think Heather and Paula highlighted there very well is that it certainly isn't the case and we, um, that there is a single view among disabled people or a single set of preferences among disabled people about remote and hybrid working. But of course, what we are seeing is that once you open up opportunities for flexibility, then other forms of flexibility, not just about where we work, but also when the hours we work um, uh, come to the fore as well. Um, and that's what we really want to see, more autonomy and control over those sorts of decisions. Um, for, for, for disabled workers. It would be great to hear from an employer's perspective. So Shani, you've been advising employers, perhaps Paulette, um, we could hear from you thinking about your, your role at Barclays. To what extent does what you've been hearing through the, the, the presentation this morning resonate um, with, with that experience? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mel. And to all the uh, contributions so far, it's been really, really fascinating. And I, I truly welcome it, this report. I think it's a really important spotlight shone on a community that so often isn't the focus of, of attention. And certainly for me as uh, representing an employer, I will be sharing the research widely uh, within the organization and we will be sense checking what we do against the recommendations and also um, where we think we're responding, what more can we do? Um, I think uh, um, what it really does is it mirrors a lot of our experience as, as an employer. Um, but I've also been looking at some of the questions uh, coming through in the Q&A and some of the points that have been raised in the research are very, very similar to uh, points that are being raised by other communities that, that we serve within the organization, whether that's working parent, parents, carers, um, people who are equally concerned about being excluded or not feeling part of um, uh, relationship building, progression opportunities. Um, and I think that's at the very heart of how we look at flexibility um, moving forward in, into the new model. And we have actively listened to our colleagues from those communities. Um, so we do have some understanding. We are very lucky that we have an employee resource group focused on uh, disability, mental health and neurodiversity. And to one of the questions that I think has been raised is, is about the granularity of the information. And I look forward to, to the response to that. But we wanted to ask our communities what would work and, and what wouldn't work. We've been very lucky as a business that we've had an approach to flexible working long before the pandemic. Um, it was an initiative launched in Barclays in 2016. We called it dynamic working at the time, but basically it was um, a real recognition to Shani's point that one size doesn't fit all. And I think as we all move towards not just diversity and inclusion, but a real focus on equity, that is super important for us to remember that putting a blanket approach in is not going to work for everyone. And I think the research really highlights that very, very well. But it is something that we've had within the business. So we are lucky that it is a uh, common language. It is certainly not something that is uh, a benefit to the more senior colleagues. Uh, we, we have more to do to make sure that it works across all um, professions within the business, but it is something that's, that's embedded there. I think the points that were raised about workplace adjustments, workplace adjustment passports, reflects again our, our own experience. Um, there was a surge of interest in people wanting adjustments through the pandemic. And I can understand that for some people, um, they wouldn't get them on time. And um, I think we're really looking at making sure that people have the same adjustments uh, for the time that they're working in the office, for the time that they're not working in the office. 
And that's been made very clear to us from our colleagues, uh, from their own feedback. And I think um, we will definitely be taking that one forward. Um, and the other thing that we've learned is that point about progression. Um, when you look at progression through an equity lens, especially for our colleagues with a disability, uh, mental health condition or neurodiverse condition, um, again, you can't take that one size fits all approach. And we've put in place a, a mentoring program for, uh, for colleagues who identify with those conditions um, that is bespoke for them. And that is, is aimed at addressing that concern around progression. Again, it was put in place a couple of years ago, but we're really seeing the, the benefits of, of that now. The final thing that, that I'd like to make is, I thought the points about multiple impairments or conditions were particularly pertinent. It's rung a huge bell with me. I'm not sure that as an employer, um, or many employers fully appreciate the complexity of multiple impairments. Um, and I think the research shows that superbly. And for one, I've taken that research and we're already looking at the way that we gather data to better understand our uh, disabled community um, through that lens of multiple impairments. So for all those reasons, I really appreciate the research. Um, we're moving in the right direction, much more that we can do, um, but this research is super helpful. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Paulette. Um, I can see the questions are coming through and I want to make sure we've got enough time to get to them. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to our other two panellists. So firstly, Alice Arkwright, who uh, is uh, in the Equalities team at TUC. Now, Alice, it'd be great to hear your overall reflections on this research. And I know um, that you've delivered research of, of your own in this space, uh, looking in particular at flexibility and, and different forms of flexibility, which I know has been raised um, in, in the Q&A. So it would be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you very much for having me on. Um, as Mel mentioned, I'm Alice Arkwright from the TUC. We're the body that represents trade unions across the UK. Um, we've published research around the experiences of disabled workers. We campaign for legislative change to defend and improve the rights of disabled people and support our unions to kind of represent, bargain, negotiate and organise workers um, in different workplaces across the country. Um, I wanted to firstly reiterate what other panellists have said um, thank you to everyone involved in this research. It's um, a really important piece to make sure disabled people's voices are centred at discussions around, around flexible working and the future of how we work. Um, the themes that have come out in the, in the research are very similar to the ones that came out in a piece of research that the TUC did. Um, last year around disabled workers' experiences of changes to location and hours as a reasonable adjustment. Um, and similar to what we're hearing from union members at the moment, as we're in a bit of a transition period, I'd say, where hybrid working is being adopted by some organisations, but also that risk of losing some of the gains we um, made from the pandemic in terms of access to flexibility. Um, some of those similarities that we've seen come in um, are around uh, the numbers of people who, numbers of disabled people who want to work flexibly in the future, very high numbers, but as um, has already been emphasised, it is different for different people. There is no one size fits all. Um, and we also saw very similar benefits in terms of why disabled people wanted um, to work from home, um, in particular that issue around autonomy and control. So 63% of um, disabled people we surveyed said they um, had greater control of their working hours when they were working from home. Um, around half have been able to change their work routines to benefit them. Um, and again, it had helped to reduce things like fatigue and tiredness. Um, um, so those benefits in terms of the way you can work, but also managing um, impairments. Um, similarly, we found challenges. So disabled people told us that kind of working from home wasn't a perfect situation all the time. There were difficulties. Um, around a third told us they lacked the proper office equipment to be able to do their job. Um, very high numbers missed the social interaction that came with going to a workplace. Um, around half had not received the reasonable adjustments they asked for during the pandemic, which is a really shocking figure. 
Um, and around a third said their mental health had worsened overall compared to around 25% that said it had improved. But I think it's really important to look into the kind of background to that figure around mental health because it really links to some of the themes that have come out in this research. So we found that when we looked at those who were reporting poorer mental health, there was a correlation between kind of poor employer support and action and poor mental health. So um, those who had said they'd had worse in mental health were less likely to have been able to change their work routines, were less likely to have control over their working hours. And um, they were also more likely to say they lacked proper office equipment, more likely to say they hadn't had reasonable adjustments. Um, so I think that links to the really important point in the report is that we shouldn't be asking disabled people to make trade-offs between their health and their career. They should have access to flexibility, which includes home working, and it should be implemented in a way that is fair um, and just and ensures that disabled people have a positive experience of work. And that's a real um, ask of employers now to make sure that when they are implementing hybrid, they're really thinking about what it means for, for disabled workers. Um, and kind of anecdotally, some of the stuff we're hearing now that hybrid is being implemented is um, kind of some of the challenges with meetings, for example. So if you have hybrid meetings set up, but you your kind of technology isn't good enough that the sound being picked up, people can't hear. It means captions can't pick it up. Um, but also this idea of a power dynamic still being in a physical space. I think we've still got a lot of work to do to shift our kind of cultural mindset that it's important to be in an office and that's where you have influence um, and there's kind of I think small things that employers can be doing to challenge that behavior so things like if you have an online meeting your chair can be online to shift that power to an online space and to equalize it introduce buddying systems so that kind of someone in the room is buddied with someone online to make sure everyone's voices are heard um, I wanted to kind of really important, I think, in the report as well as these worries about access to training and career progression. And again, I think there's a big ask on employers now to make sure that that is not happening, that people who want to work more from home or want to work more flexibly are not suffering from um, detriment to access to training or development. And a key thing employers can be doing here is... Um, monitoring so monitor who is having access to that training monitor who has access to progression um, who has access to promotion um, and then break that down by protected characteristic and break it down by the kind of types of working arrangements people have to identify if there is a problem um, the other thing I just wanted to to point out was I think what everyone else has said as well that blanket policies are kind of not the best solution we need to make sure that um, kind of there is flexibility to build in to ensure that employers are not indirectly discriminating against disabled people um, and I think again we need to think carefully about the way we talk about culture if employers are implying your culture is very much focused on being in a physical space together whilst there are benefits to that the risk is you are communicating kind of you're not part of our culture and for a lot of people that could be disabled people who need to work from home because of their impairment or as um, Paulette was saying kind of people with caring responsibilities so many people benefit from flexible working um, the final thing I just wanted to, to comment on, I'm sorry, I will, I will stop shortly, was um, the recommendations. We were really, really pleased to see flexible working as a default in the recommendations. It's something that the TUC have been calling for um, as well and agree that there needs to be um, legislation to make sure that flexibility is included in job adverts and to narrow the criteria by which employers can reject flexible working requests. Um, Putting it in job adverts means that flexibility is thought about at the job design phase, which means that the accessibility that flexibility provides is kind of upfront in any job. It doesn't require a disabled person to then ask for it, um, which we know that many people do not because of justified fears of negative treatment or rejection. Um, it also for employers brings huge benefits. It publicly shows your inclusive employer. Um, and we know that flexibility is extremely popular amongst the public. So you will see hopefully increases in the numbers of people applying for jobs, the diversity of people applying for jobs, and then ultimately getting into those positions. Um, and again, I think the report really importantly highlighted that flexibility is 
baking it in is helpful for those people who kind of don't meet that Equality Act definition or for people who don't identify as disabled. So, um, yeah, a huge thanks to everyone involved in the report. I think it's a really important piece of research and really reflects some of the stuff the TUC has been talking about as well. So it's great to have additional evidence to point to. Thanks, Alice. Thanks so much. Really helpful. And I can see you've also shared in uh, where someone's asked a question about the workplace adjustments passports recommendation that Heather discussed. Uh, the TUC have produced guidance on that and Alice has posted a link to that guidance in the Q&A box. Um, just to say on a practical note, after the session today, we will send attendees um, slides from the session, as well as links to research that's been referred to by, by panellists today. So we can include a link to that TUC study uh, in response to someone's question about that. Now we have one final panellist, so Mark, I'll shortly hand over to you. We've, we've heard quite a bit from the other three panellists about the importance of get, getting this right from an employer's perspective. Um, and it would be great to hear a little bit more about kind of how you've seen that transition to remote and hybrid work at KPMG. I'm seeing a, a real theme among the, the questions um, from um, our audience about wider forms of flexibility. Um, so it would be great to hear a little bit more about both the location side of things that we've been talking about today, but perhaps um, thinking about um, if, you, if you've been looking at other forms of flexibility too, um, I'm, I imagine we'll be getting into that a little bit more afterwards um, as well. Um, but yeah, I'll hand over to you, Mark. Thanks. Thanks, Mel. I'm delighted uh, to, to have been asked to join today. Firstly, for anyone who is unable to see see me on the screen, um, I am a white man in my late thirties with uh, a grey beard and a uh, bald head, um, and I'm a manager in the inclusion, diversity, and equity team at KPMG. So, so we welcome this piece of research as well. It's great to see bits of research like this that are really starting to look at, at the impacts much more granularly and the impact specifically on disabled people and their experiences. Um, so working in our inclusion, diversity and equity team, um, in our team, we're responsible for the kind of looking at all of our policies across all of our UK employees and across our, our business life cycle to ensure that we embed inclusion, diversity and equity in, in everything we do. And also, actually, as a disabled person myself, I, I've got a real one, I feel privileged, but a real deep sense of responsibility to ensure that our approach to disability and accessibility has the same level of um, and positioning as, as all of our approach across our other sort of focus areas across gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation and socioeconomic background. And so again, looking at this particular research, it's it's great to see that we're we're starting to really look at the impacts on on individuals. We know that intersectionality is really important. We're we're all made up of multiple intersectional identities and backgrounds, and we all have a broad range of unique experiences and circumstances. So, um, again, I think it's really important that as organisations that we're open and transparent around how we are able to, to to ask and talk to employees and listen and get their feedback and and sometimes and I think something that we're probably starting to see is that sometimes those conversations and as you open out those conversations and ask more questions that are, that are really important to the experience of people from all types of backgrounds but especially disabled people then sometimes the answers you might not get are, are actually going to be that comfortable at the start but again i think it's a really good starting point to really start to understand how we can focus on processes policies um to ensure that actually the the end, end user experience is really vital and key to that and as shani said you know if you get this right for uh, a particular group and a specifically disabled people then it's going to be better for for all of your people um i think in terms specifically related to the the research um I guess we've, again, it, it correlates and resonates with lots of uh, surveys we produced during the pandemic. Um, we, we run a, a series of surveys throughout the pandemic, looking at how our colleagues were feeling um, throughout the pandemic, where they were working, how they were working and the impacts it was having. And we were able to analyze this by sort of um, characteristic group as well. Um, and certainly the one thing that we found was across all of those groups, it was our disabled colleagues that felt the most comfortable working from home during the pandemic. 
but interestingly one thing that was always at the very center of our approach was our employees well-being and safety so it was always a, a possibility that if someone wanted to return to an office because of a well-being or a safety requirement then that was always um the, the one primary reason why anyone could return without getting additional um additional um support to do so um i think again in terms of flexibility and and how we're learning and taking some of those learnings into the the hybrid approach is i guess what i would say as well is we're still learning so much about the hybrid working approach because it's still very new so one thing that i would really highlight is that they're certainly we have no you know we've seen that there isn't a one size fits all approach um but at the same time we do need to put in place guidance policies to ensure that people that do need to have clearer guidance or a policy that that is there but but it is also um the responsibility and, and i guess we've focused a lot on trying to upskill managers and colleagues to understand that actually there's communication is really key and that it's there's an importance about how people interpret the guidance that's there as well and make sure that actually whilst there might be some guidance that says okay we'd expect that some people might want to come in the into the office a certain amount of time that won't work for everyone so preference and choice i think is really really important we've introduced things like home worker contracts if people wanted to to formally put that in place i guess similar to what paulette mentioned as well i mean we whilst yes we did have to um go to 100 percent remote working at the start of pandemic since like 2015 we'd had a policy in place called intelligent working where people could work in kind of a, a more flexible way um I, I guess we're lucky in the type of work that we do that people can and are able to access um both non-client but also client facing meetings through laptops and through um you know technology so technology has been a real a real enabler for flexibility um but yeah like i said really welcome this um this research i think the multiple looking at it in so much detail is really helpful as well and that's certainly something that we'll take forward and we're looking at in terms of how we evolve what we report on as well um so we certainly want to be um in the coming years looking at how we can look at disability in its broadest sense and understand i guess between um different condition uh conditions as well and the impacts that can have but also that the multiple condition piece again think uh, i'd share paul paulette's um um response on that as well that i think find that really interesting and something that we will absolutely want to uh look at and reflect within the work that we're doing at kpmg i think in terms of uh progression as well really important that i think organizations are able to make a visible statement so at kpmg we've always we've always had aspirational targets like i said we try and our approach on disability is exactly the same as our approach across gender ethnicity we publish we publish aspirational firm-wide representation targets we publish our pay gaps to really try and improve that transparency so for the first time well no we've been publishing a, a disability representation target since 2014 but in back in february this year for the first time we moved our disability target from being a firm wide target to being specifically focused at our most senior grades we now have a target that's focused on partners and directors and and that's now 15 percent of our partners and directors to be um to, to have a, a disability or a long-term condition by 2030 so really important that i think we're not just recruiting uh, um people into the organization that may have a disability or any any type of long-term condition but we're actually providing those great career opportunities and and you know are able to give them those opportunities um so yeah they're, they're my sort of key reflections <laughs> fantastic thank you mark it's so helpful to kind of look under the bonnet and understand a bit more about what these things actually look and feel like within an organization um, and the kinds of decisions that, that that you're trying to make to to make progress in this area that point about targets being transparent about where things are now and uh, reporting on progress i think is really positive to see uh, we know it's been really effective with gender um it would be great to it's great to think that organizations are kind of using that template 
um, to kind of set clear ambitions to, to tackle the disability pay gap, but think specifically about certain areas, like you say, progression. We heard earlier on from both the presentation and uh, other panelists that there is this real risk that emerged through the research that, that, that some disabled workers might feel that there's a trade-off between making decisions that allow them to kind of manage their health and well-being and uh, that their, their kind of career ambitions. So I think it's really crucial that when we're thinking about unlock, unlocking those opportunities for progression, uh, that flexibility and access to remote and, and hybrid work uh, are, are really central and, to that. And actually, Mel, I've got a real personal um, perspective on that as well, actually, which I'd like to share. But I'd yeah. probably say five years ago, I moved my career and moved into the kind of diversity and inclusion space. And at that point, I didn't feel like I really um had a real career that I could progress and that I had a real clear pathway um actually in this space I've been able to to really find my own pathway I've I've been able to progress um through a number of grades over that time period and actually through the um pandemic itself and working from home I actually was again was able to gain another promotion and actually found again that working from home or in a flexible way for myself was was an opportunity but but again that 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 point then related to the continued progression piece is really important to me you know in i don't know how many years time but in in x amount of years time i'd love to be in the position that paul let's kind of in now you know so i can kind of start looking at that clear, clear kind of pathway and saying that yeah actually i do want to move to a more senior role so it's really important i think that we're able to open up those conversations and and sort of talk about senior leadership representation as well. Absolutely. And thank you for, for sharing that. Now, I can see there are lots of questions coming through in the, the question and answer boxes. Um, so what would be great if, if, if Heather and Paula, um, if you wouldn't mind turning your video back on and panelists, if you're, if you're able to have your video on too, um, our, our fantastic coordinator behind the scenes is going to try and do a job of making sure that the person that's speaking is, is on display um, uh, as, as we go through the Q&A. Um, now, there are a couple of questions that um, have come through that, that I can see Paul has already had a go at answering um, in writing. And I just want us to, to start by focusing on them so that, um, that, that everyone can, um, can, can see what we've been discussing. So, one theme that's been recurring through the questions in the panel discussion is about different types of impairment or condition. So there's a question about the granularity of the research findings, um, and then also, so specifically, how different are experiences for disabled workers with different impairment condition types? We've, we've got this finding about multiple impairment conditions, but what did our data show about different impairment condition types? Now, Paula or Heather, if you'd like to come in, please do. I'll, I'll just start by highlighting something that Paula has said in response to one of these questions um, in the chat. And that's, we used a few questions to ask about impairment or condition type to allow us to benchmark with national data. Um, so what, what Paul has highlighted um, in, the, uh, in, in response to that question is that we did see that um, conditions where breathing and fatigue um, were, were a key aspect um, for, for individuals with those conditions then access to remote or hybrid working was essential um, it was much more likely to be important. So we saw some very distinct things there. Heather, I know in your interviews, you saw some real variation in the kind of motivations and reasons that people wanted to work remotely. Um, and that I know you talked about that ranging from things like light sensitivity, open plan working spaces often being the case now and, and that not always being um, accessible or inclusive for different workers. Would you, would you perhaps mind touching on, on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, yeah, what you're referring to there is some of the interviewees um, who I spoke to uh, who were autistic and had other um, kind of sensory processing um, conditions spoke a lot about um, the their set up at home being better suited to, to them, um, not having to work in an open plan office and also kind of the like, predictability of their routine so like being able to um, be more in control again going back to that theme of autonomy and control of their routine throughout the day so um, fewer uh, interruptions or unexpected unplanned interruptions and um, some of them highlighted as well that then 
having those days at home where they could be completely in control of all of those things and made days when they were in office um, and perhaps weren't so in control of those um, unexpected things that happen or, you know, things with um, like sensory it made that much more manageable than having, you know, five days or, you know, whatever their working pattern was and um, five days of dealing with that um, uh, all week. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. And I, I suppose the other thing that's been kind of that's come up through a few um, uh, of the panelists' contributions is this point about needs and preferences. Now, um, there was a question asked about whether some of the issues raised in this research are actually common challenges that are faced by non-disabled and disabled people alike. And of course, that's certainly the case. Uh, we touched on isolation, for example. Um, we did ask in our survey about parenting and caring responsibilities. And I know that um, we, we were able to look at that. Some of this, both this and the impairment condition type questions, I think we would love to explore in more depth with additional research. With a, with a survey sample of 406, we've been able to develop some fantastic new evidence, but I think we would want to have a much larger survey sample to delve into that in more depth. But absolutely, it's the case that the, there are some issues, some specific issues around balancing work with parenting and caring responsibilities, which came up both for the disabled workers in the interviews uh, and, and the survey itself. Um, now I can see, so we've got quite a few questions here to work through. Um, I'm just gonna try and group a couple um, to, to, to make sure we get through as many as we can. Um, so one, um, we've had one question about the role of occupational health um, within all of this. So it would be great to hear both from perhaps the research team, but also perhaps any panelists who've looked at this, you know, what, what, what is the role of occupational health kind of within employers or as independent advisors in facilitating those discussions about flexibility, uh, reasonable adjustments, remote working? Um, and then alongside that or adjacent to that is a bit about the kind of the regulations, the advice and guidance. So what's the role of the health and safety executive in making sure that employers are really clear on their responsibilities and the, the kind of guidance they could follow in this space. Could I hand over first of all to either Heather or Paula for any reflections on those points and then we'd welcome contributions from panelists too. Who wants to start? Oh, I think Paula, you might be on mute there. I don't specifically have an, anything to say on occupational health. I think maybe the panelists have more um, place to say something like, about that. But I think the, the research really highlighted the importance of reasonable adjustments. And you know, before the pandemic, lots of studies have been, been conducted on the importance of um, reasonable adjustments being implemented. Um, and the efficacy being checked over time. And um, I think this, this research has really highlighted the importance of that as well. Obviously for hybrid working, there's the challenge of actually pr providing equipment in both places, at home and work. And, um, you know, the flexibility is required for on, the, on the part of employers and access to work to actually enable, enable that to happen. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got anything to say on that or the HSE issue. I'm happy to add a, a response from a sort of employer perspective. Please do. Yeah, so I guess, so I think occupational health, uh, let's deal with that first, but I think it is really important. But I also think that when we talk about adjustments, we're talking about something that's so broad. And again, adjustments in their broadest sense help everyone. But I f so I think there's key levels of like communication and I think I'll even bring in health and safety into that as well because I, I, I think it's not they're not necessarily three or four separate things although often they do operate in isolated sort of process sort of um, processes but I think often it's important to understand how um, again that there's a good communication between all of those particular teams managers know how to support colleagues directly with adjustments because again adjustments could be very 
um, simple things that don't need to go through an occupational health assessment, but then it's all equally important that they're able to filter it filter the colleagues that then also would require and not just require but really benefit from having an occupational health assessment because often that's when people will understand or or get diagnosed with, with a, a condition or an additional condition or are told about some assistive technology or some support that they might have otherwise not known about so um, I think um, that they're, they're all really important aspects Unfortunately, I don't think um, they always work perfectly together, as, as you can kind of see with the issues that come out of the, the research with access to work. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there's um, a real emphasis, I think, for people to look at when we're talking about adjustments and workplace adjustments kind of in, in a broader sense and kind of bring a lot of those elements together and make sure that they're, they're kind of working intuitively and, and are kind of connected. That's so helpful. Thank you, Mark. Did anyone else want to come in there? Yeah, could I just build on what Mark um, said, which I, I really agree with. Um, but we've got to remember that occupational health and the health and safety team, they're there for compliance, essentially. And what we have to understand is when someone may approach you and ask for an adjustment, you should believe them. Um, <laughs> um, and the distinction that I often make is if a non-disabled person had a chat with their line man manager and said, I'm struggling with this, would that line manager then say, well, we can't help you, you're not disabled? Hopefully not. Um, so the place that we want to get to, uh, well, organisations should hope to get to, is that we're, we're not ticking boxes for compliance. Yes, occupational health has its place and it's, hel it's helpful in some situations, but I know loads of line managers that will tell you that some of the feedback that they get is also quite vague as well. So I think, I think it all works hand in hand, but I think we have to understand that we're here to remove barriers. We're not always here to diagnose people and assess people because that's not what sometimes people want or need. It's about how we remove barriers uh, as well. And that's, we can't forget that. I think we need to keep that at the heart of this. That's a really valuable point. And I mean, one thing that's been highlighted um, in, in the chat by a couple of audience members um, is, you know, we've, we've got a couple of really large corporate organisations on the call here, and it's fantastic to have your perspectives. Um, but of course, the situation is quite different if you are an SME, if you're a very small business or, or medium size, you perhaps don't have uh, internal um, teams or resources, you may not have a HR team um, that, that can advise on these things. Um, so there could be some really distinct challenges, but also perhaps some opportunities. So I'd, I'd also wanted to pick up something, that, a point made by a different uh, audience member in the Q&A who talked about other forms of flexibility, such as job carving. And you know, we know that it's really the smallest organisations or smaller organisations that often have the most scope to tailor a role around the applicant or around the existing staff member, if we're talking perhaps about progression. Um, so there certainly are some real advantages that, that for SMEs and alongside those challenges. Now, Heather, I know um, this was something that came up through the research and particularly through the round tables. Would, would you like to say a little bit more about about that, about the kind of challenges and opportunities for smaller employers? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we did engage with um, sort of small to medium uh, enterprise employers, uh, particularly with our employer roundtable discussion. Um, so we heard, I guess it's maybe unfortunate, but it's easier sometimes to talk about the challenges. So um, as you'll obviously have seen in the report, one of our recommendations is around consultation, but what consultation looks like in a large organisation such as Barclays or KPMG and what consultation looks like in an organisation with 12 employees, you know, it's very different um, and um, employers and managers will know um, the, the challenges around that themselves, I'm sure. So obviously things like doing pulse surveys monthly or whatever, like of, you know, thousands of staff that might work really well in a big bank, but that's not 
really going to be possible in a smaller organization and also surveys and things like that well, quite often if you're in a small team you know we the work foundation are a very small team if we did a survey of our own staff we'd probably be able to work out who was who um which kind of defeats the point of a survey so there's different ways of um engaging with your staff um through through consultations so like one-to-one -one conversations or um even you know more me medium-sized organizations might have um diversity networks so might have like staff disability networks or um other groups like that that um, engagement can be had with feedback sessions are really important things like that um as well as sort of information sessions and like team meetings and things so there's different ways that managers can engage um with their staff i would also point people if you're looking to see um things about this the real experts here the federation of small businesses so they've done some fantastic research on disability i think you know it was on the home page of their website last time i checked but if not you'll be able to find it very easily or we can we can share a link um and that research is really interesting because it talks about disability um the experiences of small businesses as employers employing disabled people but then also disabled people as entrepreneurs you know as a sm as small businesses themselves so um th there's really fantastic stuff that they they're doing there and um, i'd like to, to highlight that fantastic thank you heather um now we've had another a sort of series of questions along a similar theme um, about reasonable adjustments. So building on some of the discussions we've had, um, Alice has highlighted that, of course, flexible working, remote working can be implemented as a reasonable adjustment for disabled employees. Um, but a couple of audience members have asked questions about this. So one has asked um, about um, whether the whether the rules could be strengthened by um, employers having to implement a reasonable adjustment within a or respond to a reasonable adjustment request within a specific time period. Um, so at the moment, there aren't specific time limits for employers to implement reasonable adjustments. Um, would implementation be better if there were? Um, another, we've had a comment um, which kind of complements that point, which is many, many employers perhaps feel on unable um, to implement reasonable adjustments, um, they perhaps don't know how to do it. And it, that may tie in with some of the points about um, gaps in expertise and support, particularly for, for smaller businesses, although that, that may be the case for larger employers. Um, and finally, what can organisations do um, that really makes a difference um, in getting re reasonable adjustments promptly? So I guess bringing those points together, what works in making sure that reasonable adjustments work well within an organisation um, and particularly making sure that they're implemented in a timely way. Um, Shani, if it's okay, I think um, I, it would be great to come to you on this because I know it's something that you've looked at, but I imagine other panellists will have as well. Um, I know at the round table that we held on this topic, um, the, the round table we held with employers, this topic came up quite a bit uh, with, with several examples of people not being able to start a job on time mm. because of delays in either reasonable adjustments or, or access to work support getting um, implemented. So Shani, could you, could you tell us a little bit about in your experience kind of what are the barriers and what works in getting reasonable adjustments right? Sure, it's um, a very apparent that reasonable adjustments are one of the biggest barriers as to why disabled people can't get into work, stay in work and get on while they're in their role. Um, so it's really important that employers do get this right and are working to ensure that they have a really robust process. What tends to happen is, depending on the size of the organisation, depending on the level of confidence that line manager has or, or whoever's responsible for implementing adjustments, will mean that people have a really inconsistent process. I think the top tips that I can share is to centralize, have a centralized budget for adjustments. There's nothing worse than as, as a disabled employee being told that you're a burden or you're, you're costing me extra money because you need this equipment. And I've, I've had disabled people say that to me. And it, it's also a reason why disabled people feel that they can't ask for an adjustment. They don't want to feel othered. They don't want to feel like a burden. So if you centralise a budget, have it as a line item 
in your you know your, in your budget that that will help to remove so many barriers not only for the disabled employee but also for like the line manager as well um, we also need to have a really robust way of upskilling line managers if they are responsible for implementing adjustments do they know where to go do they know where to get expertise and if not how are you solving that problem there are organizations out there like microlink for example they can come in and they can help manage this entire process um, because it is it is um it's a very it's a very overlooked function, I think. And I've previously been in roles where I've looked after all of the adjustments for an organization and it turned my hair gray. And not because I didn't want to do the role, but because it's just extremely demanding. And then especially when you work with lots of different people, agencies and organizations. And finally, what I want to say is, I think there is a big misconception that adjustments cost the earth when actually what we know and what research tells us is many adjustments don't cost anything at all. It could be a change in targets, a change of work location, remote working. It could be a change of hours. Um, and let's not forget access to work. It's the government's best kept hidden secret. I know at the moment they're facing a lot of delays. Hopefully that will sort itself out. But th there is a big pot of money for each disabled employee to access. And I know, again, that can be quite difficult to access because it's all based on min minimum need. Um, but if you connect with people like me, I can give you I can give people lots of advice for free um, on, on how to navigate that. But I think that's just an area where uh, employers can understand they need to upskill their employees as well as internal staff on something like this. Um, so, yeah, I hope that helps. And I know others want to contribute on this, too. I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. So if, if any other panelists wanted to come in just briefly on that one, do do let me know. Otherwise, I might just um, highlight last no. couple of points. Paulette, please do. Oh, I think you might be on, on mute there, Paulette. Uh, couldn't, couldn't agree more with everything that's been said. Uh, thank you for that. So just a couple of points. Shani, that point about myths around workplace adjustments, Yes, they are hugely complex, absolutely agree, but a lot of people think that they're very expensive. And to answer the question about timings, um, yep, I'm lucky I work for a big organisation. We do have a service level agreement about when we would handle most uh, adjustments. The challenge is not the most adjustments. The challenge are the most complex adjustments. And that's where I think certainly big companies uh, have a lot more work to do, my own included, but it's where a lot of smaller companies, their, their eyes go straight to, oh, it's big, it's expensive, it's too difficult, and actually it's not. And therefore, I wonder whether uh, there's a recommendation in the report about review disability confidence. There's not a lot about what it should be reviewed for. And as I said on the disability confident uh, business leaders group, uh, I'd love to find out more because we can have that discussion around the table. But um, I do think there's been a, a drive under disability confidence to create some sort of centralised uh, resource, a pool of resources. It's a great place for SMEs or it would be a great place for SMEs to go where they can't have bespoke um, resources like we have, but they could access or be signposted. And let's not forget great organisations like Business Disability Forum, um, who have access to a lot of resources. Purple Space, who I know are on the call here today. Um, these are phenomenal organisations and we should all have a responsibility to signpost more because they could help with some of these queries. Thank you, Paula, that's really valuable. And it would be great to take you up on that and have a conversation with dis about disability confidence separately, because uh, I think there were there were a few ideas that recognise that that initial ask in the in the report is quite top line. It would be really good to flesh out uh, what, what, what sensible reforms and aligning the scheme with our new ways of working might look like in practice. Um, can, just, I, can I just add one thing, Mel, as well? Just one quick ahead. point. 
Go ahead. Just because I'd agree with everything that Paulette and Shani have said as well, but just also just picking up on something Paulette said, and we never use it actually at KPMG or in all of our sort of cons. We always are quite intentional about not using the word reasonable. We always just use adjustment or workplace adjustment. Um, you know, I've never seen anyone ask for uh, an unreasonable. We shouldn't be put in, I guess, by even framing it like that. Yes, that's used because it was part of the Equalities Act, and I'm happy for lawyers to have that conversation around what's reasonable and what's not. But it's not one that I don't think that managers and within uh, organisations, employees have to worry about. It should just, you know, I think it's important that we use um, intentional, inclusive communications to describe what adjustments, uh, you know, what we mean by adjustments. <laughs> That's a really good point, Mark. I think that, that language does really matter. Um, and it and it could be really putting people off uh, asking for support that's essential for them to do their day to day job. So I think it's a really, really powerful point. I'm conscious it's quarter past seven. We need to be wrapping up the event. Now, there are a few points in the Q&A um, that are really valuable comments rather than questions that I want to just flag that we've seen. Um, a couple of people have highlighted um, the experiences of disabled people who are unemployed. Um, that's a really, really good point. At the moment, we know that there is, there's been a sharp increase in the number of people who are out of work and not applying for jobs, um, who are either temporarily, uh, temporarily unwell or uh, experiencing a long-term health problem. Um, and that's a real cause for concern. Uh, it's not clear yet exactly what's going on there. Um, and while it's important that people aren't pressured to, to look for work, it's equally important that people who do want to work um, and getting the right support and guidance uh, to move into work and that organisations are making sure that they're inclusive. Um, we'd really like to look more at this through further research. I, one person said to talk to me about this. I think that you're anonymous, but um, we'll share our details. So please write to us if you'd like to talk about your experience of um, providing advice to people who are out of work. Um, I think with a larger survey sample, we'd really like to have looked at uh, that in more depth. Finally, costs came up a couple of times. Uh, we haven't talked about access to work very much, which is perhaps surprising given it often comes up in these discussions. Um, but one audience member has highlighted um, that costs can be a real barrier, costs of getting equipment and support for people that are out of work and wanting to apply for a job and, and on universal credit. Um, and another person has talked about just the wider economic context that people are really worried about meeting their kind of bills at the moment and, and, and struggling to get by. So it's really important in that context that every disabled person who wants to work um, is, is given a fair opportunity to do so. Um, and I, I just wanted to raise those points because they felt so compelling in the context of the discussion today. Um, finally, I'd just like to thank uh, all four of our panelists, uh, Paul Martellini for, for his opening remarks, City Bridge Trust for supporting the project and Paula and Heather for their presentation. Also thanks all of you for, for, for joining the session, for contributing with your questions, your reflections on the recommendations and suggestions. It's really valuable feedback for us. Uh, we'll certainly be going away and mulling over some of those challenge points and uh, ideas. We'll share a note uh, with the slides from the session today, the link to the report and links to TUC research which have been discussed today. Um, and if you'd like to hear more about further research uh, from the Work Foundation, uh, we do have a newsletter that you can sign up to um, and watch this space for more work from us um, on making remote and hybrid work inclusive. Thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.